Hello for you and welcome to um, factoring polynomials. We're going to talk about the factor theorem today. The factor theorem is a special case of the remainder theorem um, and our goal today is I can factor polynomials of a higher degree than quadratic using the factor theorem. Uh, so all we've been able to do up until now is factor quadratics and you know lots of methods for factoring quadratics. Once again I suggest to you that if you do not remember how to factor uh, you need to take a look back. You can go and take a look at my videos for the 2D class or you can just search YouTube for other factoring videos to find one that maybe clicks with you. Uh, anyway, we're going to talk about the factor theorem and this says part one, although part two um, is labeled sum and difference of cubes, um, it's still all sort of part of the factor theorem. So let's take a look at uh, these bulleted points to start with. This first bulleted point says a factor will divide evenly into a polynomial without leaving a remainder, uh, i.e. the remainder is zero. That's the very definition of a factor, just reminding you what a factor is. Pulling out the next bulleted point. So then let's say that x minus b is a factor of p of x. So if x minus b is a factor of p of x, that means that it divides evenly into there. And so then by the remainder theorem, uh, this means that p of b will be equal to zero. So if I sub in b, and b is what makes this bracket 0, if I sub that in, then p at b will be equal to 0. And our last bulleted point says, this gives us a way of finding factors to higher order polynomials. In other words, it means that uh, if we can find something that makes a polynomial 0, then I can work backwards to get this x minus b as a factor. So here's the factor theorem. And I'm going to give you a quick little proof of the factor theorem. The factor theorem is uh, x minus b is a factor of p at x if and only if p at b equals 0. And the general form ax minus b is a factor of p at x if and only if p at b over a, oh, and I'm missing the little equals 0 on there, equals 0. Make sure you change that on your page. So proof, given x minus b is a factor of p of x, then... Well, that means that the quotient p at x over x minus b will have a remainder of 0. So if we write our division statement, then p at x will equal x minus b times our answer when we divided it, which is q of x, our quotient, and then it's going to be plus 0 because our remainder is 0. So p at b will be b minus b times q of x plus the zero remainder. Uh, and b minus b is zero, so it does not matter at all what q of x is because I'm multiplying it by zero and then adding zero for the remainder, which is just zero. So that means that p at b is zero if that is a factor. Uh, so that's a very, very quick proof. Now, uh, here's a question. Is x minus 2 a factor of the following polynomials? Well, if that's the case, when I sub 2 in, remember this makes this bracket 0, if I sub 2 into this polynomial or this polynomial, if it is a factor, I'm going to get 0. So let's take a look. I'm going to sub in 2 where the x is. So we have 2 cubed minus 7 times 2 squared plus 9 times 2 plus 2. That's 8 equals, remember order of operations, that's going to be 4. 2 squared is 4 times negative 7. Oops. Is negative 28 plus 18 plus 2. 8 subtract 28 is negative 20 plus 18 is negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So therefore x minus 2 is a factor of the first polynomial anyway. Uh, now you give it a try for the second polynomial. Da, 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 da. There it is. Check it. See how you did. Uh, x minus 2 is not a factor of that particular polynomial.
Uh, so how is this going to help us factor things? Well, we've got this little thing called the integral zero theorem. Uh, and first of all, we have to remember that when we have a polynomial in factored form, say this thing, uh, the constant term at the end of the polynomial is going to come from multiplying these three constants together. So in other words, the constant term at the end of this polynomial is going to be negative 3 times 4 times negative 5 which is positive 60. So the constant term at the end of this thing is going to be positive 60. So if this polynomial were in expanded form, we would know that any of the zeros, anything in the brackets, has to be a factor of 60. All three of these things are a factor of 60 uh, because we multiplied to get 60. That's the definition of a factor. So in general, for x minus b to be a factor of the polynomial p at x, b must be a factor of the constant term of b at x. So I need to figure out all the b's that could possibly multiply to 60. Uh, and then I could kind of guess and check. Now that's kind of yucky. Um, and I will admit that this is kind of yucky. Um, but it does give us a way to do it. So this says factor the following. Well, we need to divide out a linear factor so that we can employ our methods of factoring quadratics. Uh, by the integral zero theorem, I know that any zero that this thing is going to have, and this really messed up here, that should be a big plus down there. I don't know why it moved everything up, but um, any of our zeros are going to have to be factors of 6. Now 6 is small enough, it's not like 60 in the last question, 6 is small enough that there's actually not that many things to check. Um, there's plus or minus 1 which is a factor of everything so that's a good thing to start with um, or plus or minus 2, uh, plus or minus 3, and then plus or minus 6. Those are the only factors we have of 6, which is enough um, because I've got 8 things to check here, uh, but I'm going to strongly suggest that you always start with plus or minus 1, um, just in case, and usually on a test I'm not going to, uh, to give you something really difficult to find. So it'll either be like plus or minus 1 or the next smallest. Um, so we're going to start, let's start with plus 1. So we're going to evaluate p at plus 1 and see if that's a factor. So if p at plus 1, I get 1 cubed plus 2 times 1 squared minus 5 times 1 minus 6. So that's 1. 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. 1 plus 2 uh, minus 5 minus 6 is not 0. So that means that x minus 1, okay, that's this 1 would make that 0, is not a factor. Uh, well, let's try the next one. Uh, let's try p at negative 1. p at negative 1 would be negative 1 cubed plus 2 times negative 1 squared minus 5 times negative 1 uh, minus 6. Negative 1 cubed is going to be negative 1 and then 2, or negative 1 squared is positive 1 times 2 is plus 2 and then negative 5 times negative 1 is positive 5 and then I have the negative 6 on the end. And if I put this uh, negative 1 with a negative 6, I have 7 negatives and I have 7 positives. So this is actually equal to 0. And what that means is that x plus 1 is a factor. Okay, Because this negative 1 is our b term that makes this thing 0. If I have put a negative 1 in there, then that would be 0. Okay, so how do we factor this? Since I now know a factor, I can divide. So I'm going to divide out this factor using synthetic division. So I'm going to put that negative 1 that I found up here. And my coefficients are 1, 2, negative 5, negative 6. So 1, 2, negative 5, 
negative 6, and I'm going to divide out with synthetic division. So 0, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 6, positive 6, 0, and this is the remainder term, remember? So that's good, we have a remainder of 0. So let's do our division statement. So therefore, p of x equals um, this x plus 1 factor, x plus 1, times, and this was a cubic, so we're starting at x squared plus x minus 6. And now we've got our factored, uh, we've got a quadratic term that's easier to, to factor. Um, we know there's x's at the beginning. We know we're looking for, since it's a simple trinomial, we're looking for two things that multiply to 6 and subtract to 1. So that's 3 and 2. And since the middle term is positive, I know that I need more positives than negatives. So there is the factored form of my original polynomial. Now, not all things, and that was the integral th zero theorem, not all things are going to have integer polynomial or uh, integer roots. In fact, if I get a number out in front of here, it's almost guaranteed I'm going to have some rational roots. And so since there's a number out here in other than 1 as a leading coefficient, there could be some fractions, and it could be that they're all fractions. Um, so we got to know how to deal with that. So to get 3x at the front, we could have brackets like this that had a 3x and an x. In fact, that's the only way I'm going to get it. I'm going to have 3x or x at the front of the brackets. And to get 14 at the back, uh, I could have had a 1 and a 14, or I could have had brackets that had a 2 and a 7. That's the only way I could get 14 at the, at the back. So in other words, if I do a big set of brackets, the front could have been 3x or x, and the back could have been a 1, a 2, a 7, or a 14, and all of these things could be plus or minus. Now, how does that get us um, factors that are all the possible zeros of this? Um, well, if we look at it, remember the shortcut for finding, if I had a bracket, uh, let's say 3x plus 7, the zero of this thing was constant term over coefficient opposite sign. Okay, uh, That's what we're going to do now. We're going to look at all the possible constant term over coefficient opposite sign um, combinations. So it could be constant term over coefficient, so it could be one-third, and of course that's either plus or minus, or it could be two-thirds, and of course that's either plus or minus. It could be seven-thirds, and of course that's plus or minus, and it could be fourteen-thirds, and that's plus or minus, or if this were at the front of the bracket it could be one x, or just 1, and of course that's plus or minus, uh, 2, because this is over 1, so 2 over 1, so just 2, plus or minus 2, uh, 7 over 1, so plus or minus 7, and 14 over 1, plus or minus 14. So this is all the possible combinations, um, everything that could be a 0. Nothing um, could be a zero of this, and, and these aren't all going to be zeros, but if it's not in that list, it's definitely not a zero. That's part of the integral zero theorem. So checking all of these possibilities is a really daunting task. Uh, most calculators will work with fractions. Um, you should have an A, B over C button, and a lot of times you have a replay option where you can just go back up and change what's in them. So if you type in the polynomial once using brackets where all of your variables are, then you can go back up and put it in again. Um, and I do realize that that takes a lot of time, um, and most of the time on a test I won't give you ones that have so many options, but if we were going to do this, we would find that p at two-thirds actually equals zero. And you can sub in two-thirds if you want and make sure you see it, see that it equals zero. So what does that mean if p at two-thirds equals zero? Um, that means that constant term is two, coefficient is three, 
and opposite sign is negative is a factor. So we want to use synthetic division here. Remember we have to use synthetic division uh, in two parts uh, because first I'm going to force that out which we'll have out here. I have to force that 3 out as a common factor so then I have x minus 2 thirds. So we're going to take a look at 2 thirds and then once I'm done I have to divide it by that 3. So what are my coefficients here? My coefficients are 3, 17, negative 17, 31, negative 14. And so we're going to go through synthetic division here. I put a 0 here, a 3 here. 2 thirds times 3 is simply 2. And now this is going to be negative 15. 2 thirds of 15, well I'm going to divide the 15 by the 3 first and I get negative 5 uh, times 2 is negative 10. And then this is going to be 21. 21 divided by 3 is 7 times 2 is 14. And then I get 0, which is nice because that, once again, is our remainder. If I didn't get 0 there, then I did not find the correct 0 up here. And we have to divide by that 3 in the second step to get 1, negative 5, and 7. So for our division statement, therefore, our original polynomial, p of x, equals this factor, uh, 3x minus 2, times, uh, and we're going by this row here, uh, it's going to be x squared minus 5x plus 7. And it doesn't look like this factors any further because it's a simple trinomial, so I would be looking for two things that, had, that multiplied to 7 and added to 5 and those do not exist. There is not two things. The only things that multiply to 7 are 7 and 1 and they do not have a sum of 5. So this is as factored as it gets uh, in factored form. So on the next page, I've just written out the division statement again. It says a quadratic factor may be able to factor further like it did the first time round. In this case, it doesn't. And a quick check of the discriminant in the quadratic formula can tell you if the quadratic factors are not. So this is worth just a quick recap. Um, if you look at that and you can't get it to factor, but you want to be 100% sure, remember that for something to factor, b squared minus 4ac must either equal 0 or a perfect square. And so we'll do a quick check of b squared minus 4ac for this one in particular. Uh, so for this one, b squared minus 4ac is going to equal, well, our b is negative 5, so negative 5 squared minus 4 times 1 times 7 is going to be 25 minus 28 which is negative 3. So this not only doesn't factor, but its roots are not real roots. Its roots would be complex roots because this is a negative number. And that concludes our lesson for today.